Good morning, everyone. It's so great to see all of you, everybody here, everybody online, welcome. So before we get started, I just want to clear one thing up from last week. So when I said I was on my way to the hockey rink before church, that was for my son, not for me. I am a hockey mom, not a hockey player. And you can tell because if I were a hockey player, I'd be singing, all I want for Christmas is my two front teeth. I can't decide which song is more annoying, that one or the hippopotamus for Christmas. They're both terrible. But anyway, skating's at 8, church is at 9.15, so everybody's a winner, except for the losing team, who are in fact losers. <laughs> it's true. Not that that's settled. We are in the middle of our series titled, Merry Little Christmas. And while Christmas seems to have gotten bigger and bigger, more ostentatious and gaudy year by year, the first Christmas was smaller, more hastily thrown together, and more overshadowed by calendar events than a December child's birthday. Are there any December birthdays in the house today? A few. So shout out to my December nephews, as well as my husband and his birthday twin, Miss Daryl. This year, there we go, thank you. Some love for Daryl and my husband, please. <laughs> this year, we're taking a look at how humble that first Christmas was by looking at it from the perspectives of the people who were there. Our theme verse for this series is Luke 2, 11 through 12. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. No matter which perspective we're addressing Christmas from, this is as true for us today as it was for those who attended the first Christmas. A Savior has been born, the Messiah, the Lord. He entered the world in the humblest of circumstances, tiny and helpless, placed in a feeding trough for animals. To quote the old hymn, he was born that man no more may die. Now, how do you respond to that? Pastor Dan kicked off the first week looking at Christmas through the eyes of Joseph, who showed us that it's better to help people have a Merry Christmas than to just wish them a Merry Christmas, and that it's better to be the light of the world than to have lights on your house. And most importantly, it's way better to remember the gift that God gave us than to spoil the people around you with gifts. Last week, Pastor D Jason talked about the shepherds. He talked about Emmanuel, God with us, and gave us three Ps to meditate on. Presence, person, and purpose. Today, we're going to look at Christmas through the eyes of a woman who needs no introduction, Mary, the mother of Jesus. When it comes to celebrating Christmas, there are many types of planners in the world. There's the planner extraordinaire, those who make and keep their plans to perfection. Then there's the procrastinate planners, you know, the people who are really good at making lists, but then they have no follow through. Then there's the delegatory planners, those who are really good at making plans for others. And then there are the over planners, you know, those people who are convinced that everything that they have to do is just going to take 15 minutes, and then they just can't understand why they can't get everything done on time. And no matter your planning style, whenever things don't go according to the plan, it's always the same story. Fire, disaster, brimstone, quite possibly the end of the world. It's your classic case of expectation. Oh, I got a picture. There's your expectation versus reality. <laughs> now, we don't know what kind of a planner Mary was, but I doubt her reality matched up with any of her expectations. She certainly didn't plan on getting pregnant before she married Joseph. She didn't plan to waddle from Nazareth to Bethlehem in her third trimester. You can forget about traveling by donkey. Just try traveling off the couch. When I was in my third trimester, I couldn't bend over, so my husband had to put my shoes and socks on for me. It was... <laughs> Kyle... <laughs> The Mary didn't plan on giving birth in a barn and having a bunch of shepherds come over to visit before she had a chance to clean up. And then a little kid pops out and starts showing her his brand new drum solo. And she just has to smile and say, that's amazing because that is what you do when a little kid says, I made this just for you. Now, the little drummer boy may actually be fictional, but the rest of Mary's story is very real. And with a single visit, Mary's life is forever changed. Luke 1, 26 through 29. God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. 
The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. And you might think it would be exciting to have an angel show up, but have you read the descriptions of angels in the Bible? See, we depict them as these beautiful people with wings and halos or like a little chubby diaper baby with a harp. Meanwhile, the people in the Bible describe them as things like wheels with eyes, having four faces, or having stiff calf legs, just your standard nightmare fuel. The number one reaction to angels in the Bible is terror. It's more like Halloween than Christmas. But I do have a picture with me of a biblically accurate angel tree topper. It's the perfect Christmas gift for the theologian in your life. You're welcome. Now, sometimes angels do appear in human form, usually when they're in disguise. But we don't know whether Gabriel appeared human or otherworldly to Mary because it just doesn't describe him in detail. Either way, I am with Mary on this one. When someone or something pops up out of nowhere and says, greetings, it might be time to grab last year's fruitcake and throw it at them. That stuff is durable. (laughs) But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have, been found, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Luke 1, verses 30 through 33. Oh, okay. No pressure or anything. Mary has just been told not only is she pregnant, but that her baby will be the most important baby in the world. Now, I know a lot of first-time parents think that their baby is the MIB, most important baby, but Mary's truly will be the most important baby ever. Mary asks Gabriel how this could possibly happen because she's a virgin. Now, my parents have six kids, and it was not at all uncommon for people to come up and ask my mom, wow, are they all yours? Yep, they're all mine. Well, you know how that happens, right? (laughs) Oh, really? Wow, I didn't, is that how that works? Thank you so much for enlightening me, grocery store stranger. (laughs) Now, Mary hasn't gone to have her wedding night. There's been no tree, no K-I-S-S-I-N-G, but here comes the baby carriage. And the angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Luke 1, verse 35. Most historians believe that Mary was a teenager when she gave birth to Jesus, maybe as young as 14 years old. When Christ comes into the world, Mary's life is upended. All of her plans are completely wrecked. And she lives in this small town where her reputation will forever be called into question. It's practically a reality show, keeping up with the Nazarenes. (laughs) And she doesn't yet know about the angel's visit to her fiancé, Joseph. Would Joseph even believe her story? Now, the angel told her, do not be afraid, but he didn't say anything about whether she'd have to raise the Son of God by herself. What impresses me the most is Mary's response. There's no fire, brimstone, and end of the world. Absent are the tears, the complaints, and the pushback. Instead, she just takes it all in stride. Mary's world has just been turned on its head, but her response is measured, mature, and it showcases the depths of her faith. Luke 1, 38. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. It's a really good thing that this happened so long ago because it's hard to imagine getting a similar response from a teenager today. In fact, it's hard to imagine getting the same response from an adult today. Just check out these stickers that were spotted in a Staples this past October. Now, they're little reward stickers that say things like, I put the laundry away. I put the dishes away, I cooked for myself, bills paid on time, didn't spend all my money, I totally adulted. And these are stickers that are not meant to be a gag gift, they are meant for a fully functioning adult's day planner. 
Now, the worst one in the bunch has to be made it to work on time. I suspect if you're an adult and you need to give yourself a reward sticker that says made it to work on time, there are probably larger issues at play that need addressing. And again, this was spotted at a Staples, not a Claire's. We do well to remember that when we are talking about Mary, we're not talking about a fictional character in a fairy tale. We're talking about a real person who lived and dealt with all of this. And it's easy to feel sorry for Mary. She didn't ask for this. No, it's a blessing and a great honor, but it's an honor that's not without challenge, hardship, and sacrifice. Her miracle will be messy. Mary and her cousin Elizabeth are pregnant with miracle babies at the same time. But Elizabeth was unable to have children her entire life. And she's older now. She's well beyond menopause and her childbearing years. So both of these facts make Elizabeth's miracle self-evident. And the news of her son John's birth is met with celebration. Meanwhile, Mary's story sounds like she's trying and failing to cover up a scandal. At times, Mary must have felt a little bit like Lucy in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, so excited to share her good news, but it sounds so outlandish that everyone who hears it is either going to assume that she's crazy or a liar, and they'll completely disregard the third option. She's telling the truth. But Mary doesn't feel sorry for herself. She seeks out encouragement and returns it in kind. Mary even visits Elizabeth, and the two women, they share in one another's excitement. Elizabeth's baby leaps for joy in her womb, and then the Holy Spirit comes upon her, and Elizabeth calls Mary blessed, and then Mary spontaneously breaks out into song, praising God. It's Mary that sings the first Christmas song. And it's a song that's not about Rudolph or Frosty. Grandma doesn't get run over by a reindeer. Mary's song is all about humility and holiness. G.K. Chesterton sums it up well. Christmas is a beautiful paradox. The birth of the homeless should be celebrated in every home. See, instead of focusing on the negatives, Mary practices that infamous attitude of gratitude. In many ways, she's Psalm 37 put into practice, particularly verse 4. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Psalm 37 is believed to be written by King David in his old age. I encourage you to read the whole passage this week. It's an encouraging psalm that reminds us not to lose heart, to keep all focus on and all hope and faith in God, even when life's not fair. You know those times where it seems like the wicked thrive and the good guys are just trying to survive? Instead of being angry and fearful, Mary is steadfast and faithful. She seeks God's vindication, not her peers' validation. I'm going to say that again. She seeks God's vindication, not her peers' validation. Psalm 37, 39. The salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in time of trouble. Mary was chosen because of her character, not in spite of it. Listen to her words. I am the Lord's servant. May your, word to be, may your word to me be fulfilled. Now, when was the last time that you said, I am the Lord's servant? Or have we ever said it? Yet this is the Christmas gift that God wants from all of his children, that we would come to him daily, not with our wish list, but asking him, God, what is your wish list? Mary had strong character, and the courage of her convictions. With her attitude, actions, and words, Mary is an excellent example of what it means to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Christ daily. And it's fitting that this aspect of her character is revealed when she finds out she's pregnant. Because this is also very true of parenthood. It's not about you. Let's face it, parents don't always get it right. Like when your kid won't stop asking you what vinegar tastes like, so you let them try some, thinking that's going to be the end of it. But then they love it, so then they start sneaking into the pantry and drinking it all the time. It was me. I was the vinegar drinker. One of the most unexpected things about becoming a parent is coming to terms with how self-centered you actually are. When Mary says, I am the Lord's servant, it's a bit of a loaded statement. 
Now, at the time, it's a statement she makes in obedience to God, but she is also about to spend the next several years, especially those early ones, serving the Son of God literally, taking care of his every need. Jesus was fully God and fully human, and fully human means fully in need of potty training. It's been said that parenting is 18 years of letting go. It's also years of diapers and spit-up stains, sleepless nights, first when they're babies, then when they learn how to drive, surviving emergency room visits, surviving puberty, being judge, jury, and executioner over every malfeasance and sibling squabble, years of getting to be the one who says no, because we all know parents love saying no, years of being wholly responsible for your son or daughter's health and well-being. You don't get a day off or a break, and when you screw up, it's not just you who has to pay the price. The stakes must feel incredibly high for Mary. Before Jesus is even born, the stage is set for some next-level mom guilt. You know how bad you feel when you screw up with your kids? Yeah, now imagine making that same mistake with the Son of God. No pressure. Like every parent, I'm sure Mary experienced the stress, workload, and complications that all seem to double when the kids arrive. For instance, I did not write this sitting in a quiet office. I wrote it sitting on one end of the couch while my children fought to the death over the outcome of a game of crazy eights on the other end of the couch. Mom life. But Mary would have also experienced the love, the laughter, and the growth that increases tenfold and just seems to multiply with each child. See, parenting is years of putting yourself aside. It's making sacrifice after sacrifice, perhaps more than you ever thought yourself capable of, and it reveals this fundamental truth. Life is not about you. And not only that, but you make a pretty bad center of the universe. Just try to live a life in service to yourself without causing misery. Inevitably, you're going to make yourself miserable and bring an equal measure of misery to everyone around you. But perhaps if we can take the truth to heart that it's not about us and learn to grapple with that selfishness instead of just accept it, we'll choose the hard work and sacrifice over a life that's maybe a little bit easier. But where I'm the center of my universe and I don't even know it. See, we take our wants and desires to heart, but we have to learn to let go. When I was little, I was really, really good at wandering off and getting lost all the time. Lost at the Field Museum, lost at the Museum of Science and Industry, lost at the Water Tower Place, lost at the zoo. One time, I even got lost in a McDonald's for 10 solid minutes. It's just just a talent I have, I don't want to brag. But at that time, my mom had four kids running around and she was pregnant with her fifth, so she had no time for this. And she told me if I got lost one more time, she was going to have to put me on a child leash. I got lost one more time. I spent the summer of 94 attached to my mom's purse strings, literally. At the time, it was horribly embarrassing, but better that than being lost in the Badlands. And when Jesus is 12, he goes to Jerusalem with his family for the Passover festival. And after the festival, his family heads home, and they're on the road for an entire day before they realize they left Jesus behind. Now, this sounds like some terrible home alone type parenting, but Mary and Jesus would have been traveling in a huge caravan with friends, family, and neighbors. It wouldn't have been unusual or uncommon at all for Jesus and the other children to bounce around between the different families or different encampments as they traveled. So now Mary and Jesus are panicking because they have lost their child, who is also the son of God, and it's three days before they find him just casually hanging out in the temples with the teachers. So Mary asks Jesus why he would run off like that, and, Mary asks, and Jesus asks Mary why she would even bother looking for him. Didn't she know that he'd be in his father's house? It's a stark reminder that, well, yes, Jesus is a child, and he has been entrusted to Mary's care. Mary is still the Lord's servant, not the master. And even she has to learn to let go. Luke 2, 51. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. Twice, the Bible says that Mary treasured these things in her heart. The first time, 
is at the first Christmas. And Mary's just given birth in a stable, surrounded by animals. The shepherds have just finished their visit, and now they're running around excitedly telling everyone what they've seen. And everyone who hears about that first Christmas from the shepherds is amazed. They're blown away. But Luke 2, 19, but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. In the middle of this huge event, Mary carefully considers and treasures these events and this child who would have this huge impact, not only on her life, but on the entire world. And 2,000 years later, even if you're not a Christian, we're still talking about it. Imagine how differently we would experience Christmas if we treasured up all these things in our heart. What if instead of being annoyed and personally offended by the endless loop of Christmas music, we let it remind us of Mary's song? What if when we feel like we can't afford Christmas, we remember that Jesus became poor for our sake? And maybe, just maybe, when we're tired of trying to salvage the half-lit strands of Christmas lights, and your cousin gets gifted the coolest subscription box of all time while all you got was a six-pack of crew neck t-shirts in the wrong size because you're not, the favorite Chris, you're not the favorite grandchild, we would be reminded that it's because of Jesus that we never have to walk in darkness and no gift that we ever receive could compare to life's greatest treasure. He was born that man no more may die. And Mary treasured the truth in her heart. And bit by bit, she let go. Mary carried Jesus and cared for him. And then she watched and wept as he was put to death on the cross. I am the Lord's servant. Who or what are you serving this Christmas season? Someone recently said, I'd like to see the Christ put back in Christmas, and another replied, I'd just be happy if we put the Christ back in Christianity. Amen. We live in a world that celebrates man in his own image and replaces God with institutions. Recently, Pfizer put on a drone display in a remote mountaintop village in China. It was reportedly to educate the people who live there on basic health habits. Now, this symbol is just one of several that were projected into the sky, and it's deliberate on the part of Pfizer. I did not take this out of context. It's not a handshake that I paused and then screen capped just so I can make my point. Uh, the whole 18-minute presentation is available on YouTube, so if you'd like to verify it for yourself, you can. So if this image looks familiar, it's because it's a direct reference to Michelangelo's creation of Adam. But the hand of God has been replaced with the hand of Pfizer. While some may walk around believing that they're God's gift, Mary knows she's not God's gift to the world. She's God's servant. She's not the Savior. She just gets to carry him for a little while. 1 John 4.10 This is love. Not that we loved God but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. At this point, I'm going to invite the worship team back up, and they're going to come up and lead us in a final song. And as we go forward into the week, I, I want you to be honest with yourself about who or what you're serving. Consider what love is as Christ defines it. It's a love that's not selfish, but completely selfless. And it's a love that calls us to something much greater than ourselves. Learn to treasure the truth in your heart this Christmas and always.